just really use this as an opportunity to, to drill down into your thoughts, coaches, coach development, you know, your current role, you know, your journey to get there. Um, obviously, I know for want of a Liverpool phrase, it's been a kind of a long and winding road to where you're at now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so why don't we start by, you know, just walk me through your, your journey, you know, where you started, obviously, as a player, um, you're at the Liverpool Academy, and then, and then all that route that's taken to where you are now. Yeah, I um, I was uh, I joined Liverpool at eleven actually as a player, um, and then sort of it was centre of excellence back then, um, and I progressed all the way through. I was at England international at fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, um, and I went through the schoolboy program at Liverpool, etc., and then managed to get in as uh, what was a YTS back then, which turned into a professional contract after after about. Uh, just after about six months um, and then I was sort of I suppose my having had some good success at youth level it sort of got to that where I was I was what I would call now obviously with my experience in coach coaching and coaching young players I was probably an early really so I was quite developed physically and all the rest of it in the early years and then um, you know 17 when it all plateaus out plateaus out um, sorry you that was my level, really. Um, and then I went to Bury after that. They they just got promoted into the, what was now League One and ended up winning again, winning the league, and they bounced straight back up. So I didn't get much opportunity there. Dropped down into non-league, into the conference, but was fortunate enough to bump into my old uh, youth team coach and head of academy, Steve Highway, in a, in a restaurant actually in Southport. And he asked me what I was doing. I was telling him I was playing semi-professional. I was sort of little part-time jobs here and there. and um, he asked me in the following week and said, look, we're starting the academy. Uh, we need um, community coaches as part of the, the setup of the, it was the sort of the first year, it might have been the second year of the academy system. Um, so I went in and I went from there really. And I, I went full time working in schools, working on soccer camps, working with the, basically the younger end of the, of the academy. Um, and then did sort of focused on the younger end for, for a little while. Then I moved to helping out with the under 18s, but I was still a community coach during the day. So I had a great, I had a great grounding because I was sort of playing semi-pro a couple of games a week at a, a decent enough level, training a couple of nights a week and then coaching in schools, coaching the age groups, the elite players, then playing myself on a Saturday and then academy games on a Sunday. So it was full, full blast really for a, for a number of years. Um, and then I sort of changed, really, I changed to looking after the younger ones. We, we identified that, obviously, the system starts at under nine. We sort of identified that we needed to look at the players a little bit younger and recruit them a little bit younger. So I set up what, what we called a pre-academy programme there, which looked at from really young age to what we did before they came into the academy. So I um, did that for a number of years and then got the opportunity to to join Blackburn Rovers is a, a big switch really when Paul Ince went to Blackburn because a, a colleague of mine at Liverpool had gone with him to MK Dons, Carl Robinson, who's who's now the manager of Oxford and we'd worked together as younger coaches and they needed a reserve team coach. So basically I went from coaching or looking after six, seven, eight-year-olds to um, working with senior professionals. And I, I always tell the story and it's that working with the younger ones helped you because it helped me certainly because you, you know, one thing you've got to do when you're working with the younger ones, you've got to keep them entertained. So it, I think that put it puts that into your into your uh, armory really, um, and then it's just the the phrase that a lot of, that's banded around a lot. You know, it's the same game, it's just a different size shirt. You know, you've got players who need attention, you've got players that you don't need as much. You know, it's it's the same sort of thing. And then I did that for. Four years of reserve, then moved up to the first team, first team coach when they were in the Premier League for a couple of seasons, then half a season in the Championship. Left Blackburn, went to Malta, actually, just on a short-term agreement. Um, whilst I was out there, got a, um, the opportunity to uh, interview for a job with the English FA, which was in coach education, which was, looking back now, was um, a really good move. And I, I would... If you get the opportunity to get involved with the coach ed, I think looking back that, um, and it was something that was sort of new to me, but it, it makes you look at yourself. Obviously, you're not doing as much on the field coaching, but you're, you're looking at other coaches. Um, and it was a really valuable 18 months 
for me really a lot of good people uh and it was a it was a sort of re-education for me really having been in the senior game for a bit I sort of was looking at youth development again um got the opportunity the only thing I missed was the was the regular coaching really and then I got the opportunity to go to Bolton when Neil Lennon went there so I went as an under-21 coach, did a little bit with the first team also. Um, we had a good couple of years there. They got they got a few players through uh, into the first team, but obviously, this, this, you know, it's been well documented. The, the club were sort of in a, in a bit of a mess off the field. Um, and then while I was there, or just before I was there, I'd interviewed for a job with England with the under-20s, and I, I didn't get the job. But I thought to myself, OK, there's something missing CV-wise, and then the opportunity came up to to go to the Middle East to take the national team, under-23 national team at Jordan. So I thought that was a good opportunity to get some international experience. Again, brilliant, out the comfort zone, living in a obviously an Arabic country, different cultures, different behaviours. Um, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, we did we qualified for the first time for the Asian finals, which was great. Um, they were in China. Um, I had about 18 months out there and then off the back of that I got another opportunity because I think once you've worked in Asia um, people you know people who have will understand that a lot of things come from it so that you know there's quite a good connection of people there and then got the opportunity to go to China to work for Shanghai SIPG on a project working with their reserve team um, so did that for about eight months really interesting um, and off the back of that, I had, a, I had a year in Norway as well as an academy manager. Um, and then the, uh, the Chinese FA got back in touch and asked me, would I, would I get involved with the under-19 team? And the role that I'm in now has sort of developed from there, really. Um, the, the general secretary, newly appointed, was a person I knew before. And he's trying to put a group of people together to help the national teams at all levels. They're trying to keep the, the national team head coaches um, local. So they, but they just want some help behind them. So that, that's the idea of the programme. So that started in January, but I've been, uh, as all of us, I've been at home since since the beginning of February. So we're just waiting on on, on getting back there. Perfect. Um, you mentioned a few things that I'd like to touch upon. Um, you said at Liverpool you were responsible for starting a pre-academy programme based around identifying players younger. Um, you know, we've seen a shift across some countries by Munich obviously closing their academy at the younger levels here in the US the MLS are pushing for the academies to start at around U13 to give more I guess local clubs the opportunity to give players more opportunities to play rather than the funnel slow it at the youngest age groups um, what are your thoughts on that in terms of your experience and how you got these players into that environment at the, at the youngest age I think one of the biggest issues was and it still is um is the expectations that probably come with the parents. I think the kids are the kids. I mean, if you, if you look at any sort of younger programme at any of the, well, any of the clubs in England, you'll see a lot of good work that's not, it's not, it's, you know, they, they're obviously selecting what they feel is the best player at that point, but they have to manage the expectations all the time. And it's, it's about enjoyment. It's about participation. It's the same thing. And it's, um, Having worked in Norway also, you're not, you're not really allowed to do that. It's like a social rule there that you can't really select anyone under the age of 13. And when I went over there, I thought, mm, well, actually, you know, there's some merit to that. And I, 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 I can see the, the point behind it. But then there's also, we get, I think we also get kidded about football, that it's, it's because we've all got an opinion on it and it's all something that we all live with every day. It's if a child was a an outstanding piano player, then there wouldn't be an issue with there or mathematics or anything else. So I think we have, the expectation is what you have to manage. I don't think it's, the kids aren't the ones that are, um, you know, obviously you want, you want to make sure that everything's, you know, you're protecting them enough uh, emotionally, all the rest of it. And they've got to be able to maximise the, the training and playing time. There's no point having them where they don't play. You know, that's, that's the worst thing you can do. So I think it's, having seen both sides, I can understand the argument around it. But I don't, uh, you know, again, I think the expectations are the biggest things that you have to manage. Uh, one of the issues, that obviously you mentioned parental, um, I guess parental education is a big part. It's in certain cultures, parents are more, I guess, clued in. And if you're at a professional academy, I guess you have more leeway to, to 
talk to parents in a way that you know you're lucky to be here kind of situation which others don't have but you also think that having players even at the youngest age in the right environment with like-minded kids not necessarily players with the same level but kids who have that same i guess common mentality and, and drive and commitment to wanting to get better instead of just having that kid who's really good but plays on the park once a week and and goofed around the whole time in a training session getting those kids out of that environment is beneficial even at the youngest age groups no i i totally agree and i think it's you know um for the better players for the ones that are ready because there are kids there that you if you're not putting them in those environments that's a disservice to them i feel and you're not they're not maximizing their potential either so i can understand both things but it's again i think it's the expectations that you have to look at i'm an old my old youth coach at liverpool steve steve harvey who obviously had a, a lot of success um he used to say you know whenever a child and a, a set of parents walk through the door you're preparing them that one day they will leave. Now it might be, you know, Trent Alexander Arnold walks in at the age of seven or six, and you know, hopefully, and he's gone all the way through, and he's now twenty, and he's you know on 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 top of the world at the moment, which is amazing. But it might be someone who's there for a couple of years, but the message is still the same. Um, you know, it's it's good, and in terms of the co- parental education, you know, even they used to talk about the thirty minutes on the way home after training could be as, as damaging or as beneficial as the hour and a half that you've just done as a coach with a young, with the, with the young player. So I think it's a huge part of, of, of you know, the whole, the whole experience, really. From, from personal experience here in the US, obviously it's, um, it's a, the pay-to-play model gives parents more of a, an opinion, more of an ability to have their say because it's a service they're being provided. So we have to kind of be conscious of that. But I think parental education across the board is a huge way to you know, minimise those problems. Um, let me ask this. When you mentioned that, you know, the academy, your physical profile, the thing that allowed you to stay at the top end of that pool, um, was there any other differentiator that you saw, um, both as a coach when you were coaching players in those age groups, but also as a player, that there was something that those kids had that made them more likely to make it to progress ahead of that physical attributes. You mentioned Trent Alexander Arnold, for example. I think mean, you would say that he had that allowed him to make it more so than a kid who was maybe as a talent as a as a twelve, thirteen year old. Yeah, I think I, I, Trent was someone who I only I only really uh, dealt with him and his family and well his mum when he was really young. So I I actually moved clubs when he was I think he when he was just about to join it under the nine but we had him in the you know he was in our little system and he was in Everton system as well um and that's the way it works over there you know with that pre-academy age group sort of six seven eight you can go wherever you want and you can train with whoever you want and you can still play for your local team but you could go to Everton's under sevens on a Monday and a Wednesday and Liverpool's on a Tuesday and a Thursday and Man United's on a Friday and then it's up to the parents where they decide to go um and and I think the and I still say it now the ones um, I've got a little nephew that plays and he's he's eight um, the players that seem to have the they want to they want to be the best they want to show that they're the best and I suppose a six I've been to see him a couple of times obviously I'm working away not seeing too much um, and I still see it in the team he plays for you know the same the six seven the same pass 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 and I'm sort of saying. Hmm. It's not really, you don't, you know, that's not what you're looking at really at a six and seven year old. You're trying to say, come on, obviously their natural tendency is that they want to sell fish at that age. They want to be the best. They want to score the goal. You know, that's the way that it works. And they're normal behaviours for, for kids at that age. Yeah. Um, and I think at, at the younger age, the best players that stood out or the ones that you think are the, are the ones that could run with the ball, really, who, could, who, who made things happen or, you know, had the desire to to um you know and the confidence to try things and to look at different you know look at different solutions i think that's the bit that makes you know you can not that you could look at a seven-year-old and say oh yeah you th- i think he's going to be you know obviously anyone would be foolish if they said that but and then there's different stages of the development isn't it and then they, they'll go for the growth spurts and it's the same you know you're looking for those you're looking for the application is the big thing that i would that, that you know makes them stand out so 
obviously just sticking with Liverpool for a minute. Um, obviously you were there and you were there for quite some time, but things have changed and I guess developed, and this long, long wait for the title has finally ended. And um, what are your thoughts on on how that I guess whole process has evolved and how important has it been in in terms of culture that was created in, amongst the group and within that whole club over the last four or five years? Yeah, I think obviously it's well, and it's, again, only my opinion, it's well documented the the, um, the effect that the manager's had and the way that he's got a clear way that he wants to play and his players have bought into this. I mean, I, I've, I've heard the stories at the beginning of his reign where the players, you know, a couple of the senior players are, you know, there's a few injuries here and there and they've knocked on the door and said, maybe this, you know, maybe we need to cool down a bit or, you know, and let's... And he said, no, this is what I want to do. This is the way that it will be. And he stuck to it. And I think it's really clear the way that he, it's a real clear way that he wants to be and he wants to play. And the players have all bought into that. Um, and he's kept to it. And obviously, he, he manages the group really well because you can see them. They've got, you know, they've got a lot of, um, there's a real togetherness. And I think it's a huge, I think all the successful teams have that. And he seems to be able to, uh, you know, he's been able to develop it and, and nurture it along that, that, the, the, the group mentality that they have because the way they play I suppose the top teams are the same the way they play it demands that everyone in the team uh, has to do his role you know particularly off the ball and that's the thing that defines the teams I think the way that people the way that teams defend is normally how, how, what defines them as a team because it's a real togetherness and everybody has to do their job and, you know, even the great Barcelona teams, I think they were the, you know, they're exactly the same. You know, you're defined by the way that you work off the ball for each other um, because it's not, you know, you don't get the, the plaudits aren't there when you haven't got the ball. Um, and I think he's, it's remarkable. And the club is a, you know, it's a monster. Now the, 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 uh, the academy's uh, done really well. Obviously, you know, of, of, of late and there's, you know, there's some really good young players coming through and obviously the manager's, given a few opportunities and you know that that bodes well for the future really when you look at that culture and um how important that is in terms of driving performance and creating the environment when you've been into the different roles you've gone in specifically in different countries how important has it been that you've been able to i guess stamp your own identity on that cultural development but also in terms of what is within the club or the or the FA, if it's an international group structure and existing, they're trying to say. Yeah, it's. Um, I think that it, it, I've spoken about this before. I think there's a real balance when you go and work abroad because obviously um, they bring you in for a reason. They, they bring you in because they want to change something, or they want to. They want your slant on it. So you have to get the. I think it's really important to get the balance between what you're there to do, but obviously without, but you have to take real notice of the culture that exists already there. My, my way of looking at it is, is that you can't really change the culture. You just have to exploit, uh, exploit it really to the best that you can. And um, while still, it's a balancing act while still trying to um, stamp your own version of how things look. Um, for example, I suppose when I, when I worked out in Jordan in the Middle East, they've got a real passion for the game. Um, the culture is not to look too far ahead. That's just the way they are. With the, with the, there's not a lot of you know not a lot of planning. So a lot of things are done, you know, sort of uh, at the last minute or you know with not a lot of um, pre thought behind. And that reflects in the games as well. So one of the things that you obviously know that the players have got that mentality and they're used to living their everyday life like that, um, that, you know, you have to sort of get some sort of uh, organisation into the way that they do things. So decide to be organised off the ball in defence, but then when they play, you let them express themselves. Um, those types of things, really. It's, it's also been the same with China, really. It's, they are very disciplined so defensively in terms of that they they have that instilled in them by the way that they're also taught but it's the it's the individual individuality and the the uh, the flair that needs developing in over there because obviously it's you know there's a lot of uh, standardization around a lot of things really so it's a, it's a difficult thing but it's obviously a challenge and it's a it's plus you add that to the the, the language barrier um 
so things have got to be really simple. Communication is really important. Um, I use a lot of video, a lot of images to, to get the points across really, but it is, it's a, it, that's the hardest bit, the balance between acknowledging why you're there, but also acknowledging that there's a, there's a certain way that things are done in those different you know, areas of the world. And when, when you were in, in uh, Molde in, in Norway, were you able to put more of, a, more of a stamp on it as the academy manager to kind of see that there was a consistency through the age groups, both in terms of what the players should be doing in terms of principles of play, game model, but also in terms yeah. of the type of players you wanted to recruit through a character-based and technical-based assessment process? Yeah, I think it's... Um, obviously, over there was a, di- was a different role. It was They had an academy that had done particularly well um, in the past, but they had another player that had progressed into the first team for, for a, a, you know, a few years. Um, and the Norwegian FA, and rightly so, a good move, they started to audit the academies and look at different things. And obviously, very similar to the English model, and I know they're doing it in the US now, aren't they? Where the, obviously the funding from the, from the FA, you know, there's a points system and a grading system. And, you know, basically you have to adhere to different things. So they wanted a... They really wanted a clearer, um, to establish a clearer game model, a, a, a development pathway for the players. Um, so that was part of the thing that we had to lay down. Um, again, touching on before around the recruitment, there's only one of the problems in Molder, or the, the biggest issue for them at the younger end is the the area, the catchment area, because obviously it's a long, it's a, a fantastic place. If you ever get the opportunity to go, it's it's a wonderful, breathtaking place, but it's a little bit out on a limb. So you've only got a particular area to, to, to recruit at the younger end. But again, it only started at 12, really. So 12, 13, um, something that we, we try to change. But then you've got a different, you know, you've got to try and then recruit nationally, but obviously, even even around at 15, 16, they're still at school. So then you've got to put them in the school program, and that's the biggest issue in, uh, over there. The establishment of the of the coach education part of it, and the coach development, and the, the the principles and the game model. You know, that was the bit that you know once you're working with the staff, you can get that going. You know, make that make make that really um, active. Um, for everybody, but it's the recruitment area that was the, that was the problem. We were trying to address that. Really, that was one of the biggest uh, biggest things to to look at. Um, and again, you know, we had a there's a basically over there. They like I said earlier, they had a, they had some good success in their academy, but then they had um, the first team obviously successful. And they won the league last year, so it's difficult. Because you've got first team are really successful and they have to be successful, to, you know, to get into Europe to obviously keep the to keep the financial side of it working. So it's more difficult for the coach to put players in. So there was a real, um, you know, the, we had to get hold of initially that top end, the sort of reserve team, Molder two, look at what what we were doing with those players, and a lot of them went out on loan. We had five or six out on loan, and that was another part of the pathway. So yeah, it was an it was an interesting project, and and uh, you know, I'm, I'm it, uh, again a wonderful place to be. With um, with that academy process starting at you know twelve and thirteen, did it make relationships with local clubs, local schools, and helping those organisations with coach education and coach development more important? So as you could know, that players coming in at that age group were of a higher level because they were getting a better level of coaching. Yeah, it's a, that was a huge, a huge part of it, really. Because, um, like I say, the social rule exists. It's not just for football. Um, it's nothing really under thirteen, and um, they're still playing local football. The players then, so you're um, club football in and around that area. But again, it's it's difficult because there's not um, if you've got an outstanding twelve year old and he's playing at a level that's not. It's it that holds him back as well. Um, but we certainly did adopt a, an approach of um, working really closely with those local clubs because ultimately, you know, you're there to help them. Um, we we started when I arrived. It didn't start till 15 the academy. So the first sort of thing that well, was going to get implemented this year was that we were going to start at 13. So obviously, then you've got to liaise with the local clubs because those those boys would normally be playing in the U13 league. 
obviously, you know, two or three from each team are going to be, you know, we're going to select them. And that has a that has an impact on the local football then. Um, so, yeah, the relationships with the, with the local people and the coach education and, um, you know, again, and parental education also was huge. It's a huge area. And now going into China and the Middle East, um, you know, football, I guess, is a growing sport there. It's still kind of fighting to be as popular as it could be in these countries with huge populations. Um, how important is it in trying to, you know, develop that part of it as well? Um, it's the same here in the US, I guess, we fight against uh, three, four other big American sports. Um, but how important is it to just make football more available, to make it more visible, to make it that first choice sport for, for these players and for these families. So when it comes to growing a, a talent pool, you've got a bigger pool to choose from. Yeah, I, th I think obviously at, at national level and government level, there's, a, there's been a couple of, um, I don't confess to know too, you know, a lot in great detail, but there, there's an in initiative to try and get more, you know, the younger kids, young kids playing football more often and they're trying to get at least an hour a week of football across the whole of China. Um, to try and get part uh, participation levels up. Um, obviously, the, C the CSL is, is growing, the, the Chinese Super League. Um, you know, it's still, it's good to see some of the, you know, the top European coaches are, are coming over. Obviously, Rafa's there. Um, Vito Pereira's been there. Um, there's been a few that have gone over, kind of Aro, Lippi. You know, that's, um, that's an important thing. Um, but, I think the worry that they have is 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 the participation levels, and I think they've tried to address that. Um, obviously, the the uh, there's a, there's still a foreigner rule with the CSL. You allowed five foreigners. One of them's from Asia, so it's still you know hopefully those those little things. But they have they have other um, tactics that they've used. For example, that the goalkeepers have to be Chinese. So that in itself brings. Uh, you know, that's a development idea and a development model that, you know, Chinese goalkeepers, young Chinese goalkeepers are, are getting opportunities. Um, there's still the under, I think there's still the under-23 rule over there, which means, for, well, for however many foreign players you play, you've got to play the same number of under-23 players. So those type of things are, are aided to try and get more younger players in, develop the football at, at the league level and then the... Uh, obviously the national teams which is really important for them um, and part of the programme we're involved with is trying to is to try and improve the national game programme really um, but I know that again at government level, level without going into it too much I know that they're trying the initiatives to get to get um, more kids playing at a younger age Can you come into a, a new role um, within an organisation or uh, whatever it is do you have a playing style, uh, a philosophy that you want to implement, um, you know, as your own? Kind of like you mentioned, the, the identity that Jurgen Klopp brought to Liverpool, or is it kind of moulded by the players that are there? Um, how how do you see that process when you've been coming into organisations or, or clubs or, or even FAs? I think obviously at club level, it's determined if you you know you've or working in youth development, you know, the principles are, or my principles are, are never really change around the ability to, to keep possession of the ball, but obviously encourage, uh, encourage individuality as well in your play. Um, I think at national level, it, it's you're really dependent on the players that you have. But one of the things, again, we're trying to do in China is to try and look at that, like the English FA had done so, so well, is that clear, defined, well, they call it the DNA, but that clear, defined way of working that, you know, what you'd know what an England international play would look like in all the different positions and that, that helps you with your selection. Um, and that's something that we're working on. Obviously, again, at club level with youth players, I think you're, it's the overall education of the players that's most important. Um, I think they've got to be adaptable. I think they've got to, you know, you've got to be able to solve problems. Um, but you've got to paint the pictures first. So I think there's a lot to still... You know the, the the strength in in your coaching staff at the younger age, particularly those those sort of twelve, thirteen, fourteen age groups. I think that's really really important. Can you talk about um, you know the youngest age group? Obviously, you've had a great deal of experience working in there, and there's a an ongoing debate, I guess, between coaches who work to 
pure technical development initially um, and opposed to get the players mastering those skills before they put them into pressurised game realis- realistic environments. And then there's obviously everyone else who says we need to put them in decision making environments as soon as possible, um, develop their cognitive skills as well as their technical skills at the same time. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I'm, I believe in, you know, we, you need to establish a good sound technical base. And I think I would never shy away from technical work, you know, specific technical work with younger players. I think it's, I think it's vital. Um, but then, you know, that's got to form a part of your programme. The decision-making aspect is vitally important, but it's all got to link, in, in my view. But I would never, ever... Uh, it, it's a, and obviously, it's also a balance. It's also a balance that depends on the age and how often you have them and, and the players and what their, you know, what their particular needs are at the time. But for me, my own personal view is that, you know, I would never shy away from or discourage individual technical work that leads into and the players can see where this uh, you know where it fits into your program in terms of the next bit with the decision making yeah I agree I think knowing the players as you mentioned is the most important part of that because you know when players can handle that next step if you've been working with them and have got to know them enough to, to do that part of the process jumping back into um, the coach ed part you, you mentioned kind of tied into what the players who made it was there anything that you saw when you Working with coaches that obviously football is a game uh, where there's a lot of ego involved. <laughs> um, but wait, is there anything you saw in coaches that were more likely? You said this coach I think is going to be a really good coach. Was there anything that indicated to you in that when you were working with them through these coach education processes? I think, I suppose it's like anything. I think the, the, the relationships is huge, the way that the, the, the coach's ability to communicate, but is also is his relationships that he builds with the players. And when you work in a club level, obviously, you know, whatever, if you're the under-12 coach somewhere, you're seeing that that player, um, you know, two, three, four times a week, and you're able to build that relationship with them. Um, coaches that keep things simple, um, and I know that's that's an easy thing to say, but, you know, the, the, the pitching, the practice and pre- in terms of level for the players at the right time, the right... The, you know, the, the, the right practice for the player at the right time, I think is massively important. And I suppose it's the communication element of it and the way that they can um, get the best out of the players or, you know, know them, know, know the players individually. And I think that only comes from relationships and building relationships with them. So I think that's a, that's a, a huge uh, indication, really, of how, how, uh, um, how you're seeing a coach develop, really. Through all of the um, the process you've been through and through all of the other coaches you've seen, if you had to, I guess, give one piece of advice to to young coaches, coaches who want to coach at a high level, um, just starting out, or even have been doing it for a while but are really keen to see their development, um, what, what advice would, would that be to them? I would say coach. Do as much as you can at, at any level because it, it, um, it prepares you. I think getting out and making mistakes and looking at practice design and saying, OK, I've got that wrong there. That, there's nothing wrong with that. And you only get that from the hours on the field. Um, so I would encourage anybody, if, you know, if they're starting out, you've got to get the hours on the field. The, uh, the qualifications at the different levels happen the more, you, the, more you, um, the more you progress and the more hours that you get. And I think understanding and testing yourself within the parameters and knowing what's best for the players. Um, I think that's that's the key. But my, my answer to that, I, asked, I get asked that quite a lot, is to coach. Coach as much as you can. Um, it's important. You know, sort of, again, I, I keep going back to Steve Highway. He once said to me when I was a younger coach, listen, when you've got three footballs uh, and three cones and 40 children walk over the hill and you don't panic because you know what you're going to be doing, then that's when you think, that's when you're a coach. So it's interesting. Adaptability, it only comes with hours. Perfect. Um, well, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, Ian. So I really appreciate um, your time today. And thank you for taking the, the opportunity for our coaches who've been involved in this and for myself to, to ask you some of these questions. Um, we really appreciate it.